You're all very welcome. Um, for a start, maybe uh, you would like to do what I do, and that is switch your mobile phone off, uh, so as to avoid any possible embarrassment later. Uh, we are very lucky today to have um, uh, one of the uh, most competent speakers um, on any subject in relation to Russia, uh, to talk about Russia and Europe redefining the relationship. Uh, Russia and Europe is uh, a very interesting subject historically. Uh, you could say that uh, Russia uh, sometimes is considered uh, as of Europe, but not in Europe, and sometimes also considered in Europe, but not of Europe. <laughs> And you could say that the history goes back uh, maybe to the 17th century with Peter the Great opening a window onto Europe. And Peter the Great himself, of course, became a factor in European history and was active um, in uh, changing the um, political formation of part of Europe. Uh, and you could go on to um, Alexander, uh, the emperor, um, who uh, outdid Stalin. Stalin when he was congratulated uh, in 1945 on reaching Berlin, pointed out that uh, Saul Alexander reached Paris. Uh, we, we all know <coughs> the history of the period after 1945 uh, when uh, Russia or the Soviet Union uh, was uh, involved right up to the central line dividing Europe into two. Um, since then, uh, there have been uh, various uh, efforts to define uh, uh, Russia's relations with Europe. I think President Yeltsin at the beginning wanted uh, Russia to be part of Europe and indeed President Putin at the beginning, very beginning of his period of office uh, expressed uh, a wish for uh, Russia to be a full part of Europe. We go from that to today where I read in the newspaper today that uh, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe has warned everybody of the dangers of a Ruxit along with a Brexit. Uh, that's to say uh, that Russia might be suspended from the Council of Europe uh, where it hasn't had a vote since 2014 and as far as I know hasn't paid its dues to the Council of Europe since 2014. So uh, the question of Russia and Europe is uh, a perpetually um, uh, exercising one. Uh, we could have no better speaker to talk to us today uh, than Dr. Dmitry Trenin, who is the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the Carnegie Moscow Center is an absolutely indispensable resource for anybody who wants to uh, read reasonable views, objective views, about the problems faced by Russia and uh, faced by the rest of us because of Russia. So uh, we are very glad to have you, Dr. Trenin, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, <coughs> if I may. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Murphy, for uh, these uh, uh, warm uh, words of welcome. It uh, gives me a special, a special pleasure to uh, address you this, this afternoon. It's, um, it's been a long coming to, to Ireland. Uh, for me uh, uh, and my wife, we, um, uh, we attempted several times, but uh, for, various for various reasons, under different circumstances, we could not uh, make it. We're so happy that this time we actually made it. Um, I will uh, talk for maybe um, 25, 20 minutes, I really look forward, maybe less than that, I hope less, so that we can have more of a discussion, and um, I really look forward to, uh, to discussing those things with you. Um, I think that um, I would start with, um, there are several things I will, I, will, um, uh, I will offer to you as just broad thoughts that uh, we can uh, elaborate, elaborate on later. Um, I will start with um, what happened in 2014. 
Uh, of course, that was the year of uh, the Crimea crisis, the Ukraine crisis, uh, and that was the year when uh, Russia's uh, um, unique quest for Western integration, becoming part of Europe, however defined, uh, that came to an abrupt halt. At the same time, another major pillar of Russia's foreign, or the other major pillar of Russia's foreign policy um, uh, was, was equally destroyed, and that was Russia's attempt to reintegrate the former republics of the Soviet Union uh, into a new um, construct uh, with Russia as a center. So come 2014, the two main pillars of Russian foreign policy, it's integration, attempted integration into the West slash Europe, and its attempt to reintegrate the former republics of the Soviet Union, they both uh, became history. At least for, um, at le I think that as far as the former republics are concerned, that's, that's history full stop with regard to Europe uh, and the West. Uh, uh, this is certainly something that, um, uh, that is at, at least suspended, but also uh, maybe likely uh, over for the foreseeable future. Uh, when Russia or Russians look at uh, Europe, uh, they see triple. They see, of course, the European Union, but uh, the European Union to them is, uh, uh, is largely a powerful economic bloc without um, a strategic dimension, a geopolitical dimension. Um, this dimension is represented by what they see in NATO. This is the other thing that they see when they look at Europe. But NATO is perceived to be, as it was perceived during the Cold War, as essentially a platform for U.S. Uh, foreign policy, or U.S. forces uh, in Europe. And then, and that's the most important bit, they see the various European countries, uh, some of which have been Russia's neighbors for hundreds of years, and others have just emerged on the map of Europe, and some of them were actually uh, former provinces of uh, Russia itself, either, either as an empire or as the Soviet Union. And I would say that Russia basically lays emphasis on, uh, on the states of Europe uh, for most things. And only in the second uh, instance on the European Union as an economic powerhouse, as the, as the economic regulator. And as far as the third thing, the NATO thing is concerned, uh, this is not about Europe at all. My next point is that um, uh, relations with uh, the European Union, which uh, Ambassador Murphy mentioned that, uh, looked so promising to uh, many Russians uh, in the early 2000s and in the 1990s, so that Mr. Putin, in his famous address to the German parliament, the Bundestag, back in uh, October, uh, 2001 talked about Russia's European choice. Uh, the European Union is uh, not seen right now as a strategic partner that, that, that it was, at least it was called for, for many years prior to the Ukraine crisis. And uh, due to, to, to the sanctions imposed by the Union, uh, the relationship is essentially frozen. Um, NATO is seen as um, <laughs> essentially um, um, an anti-Russian um, organization led by the United States, not as uh, uh, threatening <clears throat> as NATO was during the Cold War, and yet something that uh, is seen as uh, um, inimic to Russia's core security interests. 
And it's only the bilateral relations, it's the economic ties to individual countries, it's about trade and investment and technology, those things are considered to be of, of real value. So Europe, uh, my conclusion here would be that Europe to Russians is mostly about the economy, it's mostly about investment, it's mostly about uh, many, uh, many social things. People come here for medical treatment, people come here to, uh, for recreation, people, some people keep their money, other people keep their families, and still others send their children to Europe. But it's not about uh, the grand strategic issues. Um, does Russia want to split the European Union? This is something I hear very often from my European friends. Uh, to which I would answer that Russia does not see the European Union as a, as a big problem for itself. It sees NATO as a, as a big problem. But um, splitting uh, NATO is something that is uh, considered to be, I think, uh, pretty difficult or, frankly, impossible. Um, Russia is not so much engaged in splitting the European Union uh, in the divide and rule formula as trying to um, calibrate its approach to the various European countries to uh, ease, um, either ease economic pressure on Russia, sanctions pressure, or to go around the sanctions and, uh, and, um, and engage in economic projects that would uh, make sense for Russia. And again, you see so many examples of that with the North Stream uh, in, with Germany and um, various other economic engagements with countries such as uh, Italy and Austria and France and even Hungary. Uh, there are different countries in Europe. Are, they have different interests in Russia, with Russia, and they have very different historical experience with Russia, which, um, which helps Russia and which makes it more difficult for the European Union to establish a common denominator for its policy toward Russia which I think is more of an objective fact than a result of Russian scheming. Not that Russia is not scheming, I think it's, uh, it is uh, clearly trying to make the most of, uh, in many ways, unfavorable situation. But uh, it's essentially about uh, those larger reasons that uh, make some countries uh, more open to engagement with Russia than others. Um, does uh, Russia does Russia threaten Europe? I think this is something that uh, I often hear uh, again from my European friends. Whether what happened in Crimea in 2014, Donbass, does that presage um, a reconquista, uh, uh, an attempt by Russia to reconquer? the territories lost uh, as a result of the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, and of the, and the loss of the Warsaw Pact. Um, I think that for some people this is, uh, um, such a view is uh, essentially born out of uh, their own country's experience or their interpretation of, that, of their own country's experience with Russia. You hear it from the Baltic states, you hear it in Poland, you hear it in Romania, and in a number of other countries. Um, and I don't think that um, uh, there is a, a chance of Russia persuading those countries or convincing those countries that it does not cover their territories now. I think the, the, uh, the chance of Russia invading any of the Baltic states is just not just slim, it's zero, it's zero full stop. And yet, you will never be able to convince the people who will continue to look at Russia through the prism of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and uh, the deportations uh, of the 1940s uh, and, and, and other things. Um, the Russia threat, however, is uh, the glue that uh, 
essentially keeps um, NATO focused on Russia. I mean, if you have a, a military alliance, it is not enough to have common values. A military alliance is not about common values. Common values may be very important uh, or an important factor, but uh, NATO was born when uh, it included uh, a number of dictatorships within its midst, and it was not about democracy. It was about uh, standing up to the Soviet Union, standing up to communism, and that was what NATO was all about. And that's why when the Soviet Union disappeared, NATO entered immediately uh, into a crisis and before it found a new, um, uh, new threats to focus on new um, um, uh, new areas of engagement where it might be useful out of area or out of business, that kind of thing. But uh, with the Ukraine crisis, NATO has rediscovered its, uh, its old, uh, uh, its original mission, and I think it will stick to that mission because it's, uh, it's, it's so useful. And the Russia threat, to me, non-existent as it is, and you look at the, uh, the, the balance of power, the balance of forces, the balance of financial resources, a, any kind of balance which is clearly skewed uh, in, in, in the West's favor, uh, the Russia threat is, uh, is not there. Um, and it's not, frankly, in my own experience, it's not really believed uh, uh, anywhere east of Berlin. But, uh, uh, excuse me, west of Berlin. But east of Berlin, this is, uh, this is a different story. Uh, Russia is often accused of interfering in, uh, in European domestic politics. Um, and I think uh, there is some validity to those claims. In today's world, uh, borderless, essentially borderless world, um, you are essentially free to operate. And uh, I can imagine uh, Mr. Putin somewhere around 2012, after the Moscow protests that um, were very much supported, uh, if not politically, if not financially, as Putin accused uh, the organizers of those, of those protests, but at least there was uh, emotional sympathy for those protests in, 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 in the Western media, uh, Putin may have resolved that uh, Russia would, uh, would strike back and would do to others that the others were doing to him. Of course, the others were trying to promote democracy, promote human rights, uh, to Putin that was trying to sap at the, at the foundation of, uh, of the regime, of the system, of, the, of Russian statehood. And uh, he, is, uh, he is pushing back. Essentially, uh, what happened uh, to, to Russia after 20, Russian policy after 2012, was Putin uh, lifting the uh, restrictions on uh, dealing with uh, uh, other political forces than governments or established uh, political, let's say, governing parties in, uh, in, in various countries. It's for, for two decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia stayed back from, uh, even within the, the post-Soviet uh, Commonwealth, the CIS, step, st stood back from actively engaging with the opposition forces. You only deal with the government of the day. After 2012, that was lifted, not only for the CIS, it was lifted for, for the entire world. So when Russia reaches out to the Alter Alternative für Deutschland, well, they are a party that exists. And uh, if there is something that uh, Russians uh, can learn from them or to whatever, they, they go for it. And I think this is, um, this is unlikely to stop. I, I find uh, much of that to be, uh, frankly, devoid of a strategic, um, uh, of a strategy. It's one thing to invite Marine Le Pen to the Kremlin a couple of days before the French presidential election. Uh, but what's the strategy behind it? What, what is the message that you are trying to send? Have you thought it through? And I'm not sure that it was. Otherwise, I wouldn't find it 
strange or objectionable. When uh, Macron, who was, of course, Le Pen's uh, opponent in the 2017 elections, traveled to Berlin, that was nice, that was fine, that was within Europe, within, you know, uh, the European Union, it's almost domestic, um, a domestic affair. When Le Pen at the same time traveled to Moscow, that was different. Now, I, it's, it's difficult to, um, uh, to um, uh, argue that uh, you can only go to certain countries, not to other countries, and meet certain people, not other people. I think what Russia is, uh, is trying to do now, not just in Europe, but more globally, is uh, being in, trying to establish contacts with all relevant parties, whoever they may be. If you are relevant, then you are on Russia's contact list. Look at the Middle East. Look at Syria. Uh, Russia can be, uh, well, on, on very good terms with Israel and Iran at the same time, with Iran and the Saudis, with the Turks and the Kurds. So if you are relevant, then, uh, um, then you can be uh, contacted by Russia. And I think in the Middle East there have been you know, they've been uh, doing it rather effectively. Of course, there's another, there's another kind of relevance that makes you Russia's enemy, such as ISIS or some, uh, some other people. But even the Syrian opposition, Russia was bombing them, bombing them essentially to nudge them to the negotiating table with, the, with Damascus. You soften them up from the air and you bring them to the... It's, you may say it's cynical, and it is, but this is, uh, this is, this is the policy. So to the extent that Russia is uh, interfering in Europe, I think there's uh, a lot of, much of that, in my view, lacks strategic thinking. I don't believe that there's a strategy in Russia, a good strategy for dealing with Europe in this, uh, in this new environment. But um, certainly restrictions on all sorts of contexts have been, uh, have been lifted. Uh, there is, uh, I think, a degree of interference, but uh, to Putin, uh, this is nothing more, actually much less, than what he sees as Western interference in Russia through uh, various NGOs, through various um, uh, meetings between uh, Western officials and, and Russian opposition people, not to speak of Western interference in uh, countries such as uh, Ukraine or, or other, uh, other countries, including some of Russia's own um, uh, allies and partners in the, um, such as Belarus and others. Um, I can, uh, we can, we can talk about the Skripal case if you want um, in, in, uh, later on. I, I, I noted it here, here but I, I really want to keep my remarks to, to the barest minimum. So we have, um, and I'm coming to, to some sort of a conclusion, uh, we find ourselves in a, in a difficult uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Uh, as Ambassador Murphy said, um, Russia has had a very complex relationship with Europe uh, through, um, through the ages. Uh, Peter the Great was the one who started Russia's modernization, taking Europe as a model. Boris Yeltsin uh, looked or accepted Europe as a mentor. Now by now, um, both the model and the mentor no longer apply. Europe is neither for Russia. Neither a mentor nor a model. Uh, I think that what happened in 2014 reverses not only the trend toward a common European home that uh, Gorbachev initiated 30 years ago in his speech to the Council of Europe, and Russia's membership in the Council is in danger right now, um, but also the 300 plus year old trend started by Peter the Great, with Europe being the place where Russia would want to be. I think um, the new, um, mentality that is spreading within the political class in Russia is that Russia st stands apart from Europe. In fact, it stands apart 
everyone in this world. You live in a, in a grand Eurasian neighborhood with Europe to the west, with China and uh, Japan to the, uh, south, to the east and the southeast, India and the Muslim world to the south, and you are in the north of this grand Eurasian landmass. You are, uh, as Russia, a global country, a global player, but you are not part of anything. You're not part of Europe, you're not part of Asia, you're not part of the American empire, you don't want to be part of the Chinese empire if it takes shape. So you are um, a country that uh, is not a superpower, it does not want to be a superpower, it's not in the running with China for the primacy in Eurasia, it's not running against the United States for any superpower, um, any superpower rivalry. Uh, in the world, it, is, uh, it sees itself as a great power, but the meaning of a great power is different from what it used to be. It's no longer a power that dictates to others. It's a power that does not allow anyone to dictate to itself. And that's, the, that's a subtle change. And uh, Europe is a, is a close neighbor, it's a near neighbor, just like China, it's another neighbor. Of course, there's so much more affinity toward Europe, and Russians are and have been, and and will be primarily Europeans of European stock, uh, originally with um, uh, essentially European background, uh, and of course culturally uh, part of a larger European civilization that includes also the Americas, but politically and strategically they will be apart from Europe. And that's... Um, and at the same time, the empire is also uh, being written off, more or less. It's being rather converted in the Russian mind into uh, new neighborhoods. There's a new Central Asian neighborhood. There's a Caucasus neighborhood. But it's not that you somehow uh, regard those countries as uh, not exactly foreign. I think we are growing away of that uh, togetherness with the former borderlands. Uh, the, the central issue between Russia and, and Europe today, uh, of course, is Ukraine. Um, I don't think that uh, the election that's taking place right now, the second round, will be um, in uh, uh, three weeks, uh, less than two weeks' time. Um, or the elections that will follow in October, I don't think it will change the situation very much. I think we will more or less uh, be uh, where we are today going forward. Um, I don't think it would be productive to think of a solution of, uh, to the Ukraine crisis in terms of essentially Russia surrendering uh, itself to the demands of uh, Ukraine and uh, its Western backers. I don't think either that... Uh, uh, Ukraine or the countries in the West uh, are open to some kind of a compromise on Ukraine, which would meet uh, Western and Russian and Ukrainian interests. I, I think we're very far away from that. So the best we can hope for is that the situation does not, is, is continues to be under control more or less, does not explode into our faces, that we do not uh, see a degeneration of the conflict into an open war. Um, and I think that uh, there's a good chance that we can achieve that. Uh, beyond that, um, after the Russia, uh, after the United States and Russia um, somehow reach a new equilibrium in their relations, uh, there may be a, a new equilibrium also uh, regarding Ukraine. But uh, with regard to Europe, I think we need to start uh, thinking seriously about a new compact between Russia and Europe, no longer placed, no longer, um, placed or founded on the idea of Russia Europeanizing itself, becoming more like Europe. Because I think we've traveled a little bit along that road and uh, I don't think we will hit that road again, not in the foreseeable future. Not that Russia will not modernize, not that Russia will be um, inimical to things European, but bec Russia becoming 
just another European country uh, within the framework of uh, norms and rules established by the European Union, uh, it, to me, it looks um, uh, very, very unlikely. So we need to find a new equilibrium on, on a new idea. And this new idea could be, uh, well, neighborhood, good neighborhood, uh, re mutual recognition of uh, diversity. Russians will be unlike Europeans. R Europeans will be very different from Russians. And there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, Russian, uh, um, there, there's, there's a Russian narrative about how Europeans have lost the way and all that, uh, to me, nonsense. Uh, Europe is entitled to its own uh, devices, and Europe is entitled to go in the way that Europe uh, chooses to go, and it's not for Russia to decide what is truly European, what is not truly European, who has lost the way, who has not lost the way. So mu there must be, in my view, mutual recognition of, of that diversity between Russia and, uh, and, and Europe. And, um, uh, and then a lot will depend on what kind of Russia and what kind of Europe will emerge in, uh, let's say, the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Russia faces enormous challenges, enormous economic, social, political. Uh, there's a, a very difficult transition ahead, political transition away from Putin. Uh, it, it will take uh, much time and it, will, it, may come, it may result in many surprises, some pleasant, some unpleasant. Um, there needs to be a new, new system of governance. There needs to be a new economic model for Russia that would allow it uh, finally to start developing, start growing. And of course, the future of Europe is, uh, is also, when you look uh, ahead now, is not very certain what happens to the European Union. Uh, but after a period of time, I think we will have a, a better understanding of which way we're heading, and uh, that would allow us to come to, as I said, a new compact, which will be uh, based not so much on expectations as the 1990s compact was, uh, or ideology, but on, uh, uh, on the realities that uh, make Europe and Russia perhaps um, the closest neighbors to each other. Of all the neighbors, all the physical neighbors of, of uh, Europe, Russia could be the closest one. Of all the physical neighbors of Russia, uh, Europe could be the closest. And that, that's a good, a good basis, as good a basis as any to build a solid relationship on. Thank you very much.